All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to another episode of Purpose Driven Pivot. I'm your host, Greg Clay, and you are in for an exciting, exciting interview. And thank you for those folks that are joining us via Zoom and also via Facebook. Uh, I have the honor and privilege of sharing uh, stories, narratives, uh, a, a lot of different things in between with people that have uh, joined this platform. And today is no different in the, in the person that I've got joining us today, a good friend of mine, Dr. Nicole Garner-Scott. Nicole, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Doing awesome. Good. It's Thank awesome, you. awesome to see you. Folks, we, we tried to, to not talk about too much during the pre-show uh, conversation. And, and as I mentioned before, because I have this personal relationship with so many awesome people, we want to make sure that you get all of this great content. But Nicole, we got straight to it, you know, and just talking about growth talking about 2020 and all the amazing things that you're doing and the journeys that we're both on trying to influence people around health and wellness. I know we'll talk about financial wealth, things that you're pivoting into, um, but you know, I I'm so excited to have you and thank you so much for uh, your time uh, today and sharing a lot about your purpose, you know, things that you're pivoting into and everything in between. And so how, how are you feeling? I feel good. I feel really good. I um. I live in South Florida now. I live in Miami. So I'm back and forth between Atlanta and Miami. And mm -hmm. um, I'm just, I got really spoiled by this weather really quick. And I, I'm acting real brand new when it gets cold. So right now, <laughs> I'm doing good. I, I, I'll never forget my time in, uh, you know, coming from Atlanta and going down to FAMU. Shout out to the Rattlers. I remember when it first got like, uh, we kind of wintry mix that came through and it was like 60 degrees uh -huh. and everybody had on all this leather. Like everybody brought out their leather jackets. It was like 62 degrees. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that I definitely miss is, is the Florida weather. And so I know you've been going back and forth, not just, you know, between Atlanta and, and Miami and Florida, uh, you know, for work. You It seemed like you're all over the place, Nicole. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I mean, probably for the last decade, I have pretty much lived in the skies. Um, 2020 has probably been the first year I had to uh, sat down, not sit down, but sat down uh, for a while. And um, as we were talking before we, before we went live, it has been so many lessons learned in that sitting down and it's been so much growth mm -hmm. and so many things that we perceive to be mandates in our lives, mm -hmm. I really started to realize that, you know, they weren't even necessary. Like I was reading this article yesterday that talked about Silicon Valley. All these greats in the tech space are all moving to like Florida or places they really want to live now mm -hmm. because you can virtually work. Like it, it, business didn't stop. Everything kept moving. The sky didn't fall you know, with people working from home. And so now it's like, well, let me live where I really want to live. And, you know, what makes sense to to my happiness and what makes sense to how I want my life to go. And so um, I think 2020 was a big notice. Now, the now internally, I, I got to travel again. Like, that's just, <laughs> that's, that's who I am. I love meeting new people. I love new experiences. I love stretching my brain. Um, and I love the work I do in so many different spaces. So that in itself, you know, but um, I'm not in a rush though. You know, like I, I feel like in my twenties, I used to be in such a rush for everything. Like my parents used to be like, hey, you know, you had the rest of your life. And I'd be like, I gotta get it now. Like right I now. Got, it's all gotta happen now. I don't know what's coming, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But now it's just like, I, I'll get back to that when it, you know, when it comes back around, when it circles back around, I'll get back to it. I don't want to preemptively rush into anything. So, um, you know, just, just taking a lot of the lessons that I needed, I personally needed this year. Good, good, good. So you, you mentioned unnecessary mandates. I want to start our, our deep dive there and then talk a little bit about some of the more practical things you're doing in your, your personal life, your, your professional life and pivots there. Uh, but I want to back up a little bit and tell folks that, you know, Nicole is a good friend of mine. We've known each other for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Both of us are from Atlanta. Shout out to the Westlake High School family. Uh, you know, everybody know I went to Mays, so shout out to Mays. But after you get a certain 
certain age, Nicole, it's all kind of the same. The home team right, runs with right, the home team. Right, 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 right. And we roll out the welcome mat for people that aren't. In That's high school, said. it was like rivalry, but afterwards it's like, oh, we're all from the same part of Atlanta. <laughs> then you get older, then it's like, oh, we're all from Atlanta. Right. So, you know, it just, it, it collaborates in so many different ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that too. So for the people that get it confused, you know, you got two true blue natives reiterating that again for the airwaves, right? right. Uh, but but y'all, Nicole has been uh, an icon and leader in the PR space. Uh, through the Garner Circle and the work that she was doing through that uh, vertical, right? It was, it, I mean, really, really defining an era in Atlanta around how people connected with content, connected with people, connected with businesses, connected with issues. Uh, and so she was in, in that lane and still is in that lane as an influencer uh, in doing amazing, amazing work. Uh, we, we know a lot of the same people. Uh, and, you know, when Atlanta became kind of this new Atlanta, it was folks like Nicole that were ushering in a lot of those conversations. Whether you know it or not, Nicole, a lot of the trends that were being set, a lot of the things that were being normalized in this new space when it came to just the creative culture and content and the leaders in that space, Nicole, I consider you one of those folks. Um, but, but she is now with Amount Financial uh, mm -hmm. doing some amazing things related to financial health, financial mm -hmm. wellness, I mean, really beating this drum around financial independence uh, related to how folks can take steps, both small and large, uh, to get their financial health in order. And so, Nicole, I'm excited to hear about all of that stuff. Uh, and while for me on the surface, the, the pivot might seem seamless, it, it seems like kind of one and the same. I mean, when, when we think of a lot of the things that you've been able to do, when I say we, I mean, just the home team in general, like you've really, really led some remarkable, remarkable things and great energy around, you know, your professionalism, your relationships um, and things of that nature that I hope that folks that are watching uh, get a glimpse into from our conversation today. And so I, I really want to start, Nicole, like just, just tell the folks a little bit about yourself in addition to, you know, uh, being from Atlanta, you know, where you went to school, uh, how you started and, uh, and, and really kind of fast forward to where you are today and you can fill in or you can gloss over whatever it is that you like. Okay. Well, first I like to say, it's so good to have these type of conversations with friends because these always end up being my best, in, my best talks or best interviews because everybody's so relaxed, right? Like we know Greg Clay and then we know Greg Clay, you know, so <laughs> having both sides of, of just fun and a uh, real, energy and um, just a, a level of knowing that um, there's that that rapport there. I'm, I'm just excited to be on this uh, with you. And then you've had so many of my friends, you had Adam Jackson on and, and um, just so many other people that, you know, it's just, it's just good vibes all the way around. But just to jump in a little bit about me, um, born and raised in College Park, Georgia. So for those of you who are truly from Atlanta, you know where that area is. Um, I was born kind of close to old National Highway, so that is why that area will always be close to me um, and always be a part of my life. Mm -hmm. um, when I was young, that's when I, I say I started in the world of entrepreneurship. I was the candy lady in my neighborhood. Um, I was a person who was always selling things at school. Uh, just had to figure a lot of things out, you know, very early in life and really got excited about being able to create my own. And I blissfully had parents that saw that ambition side of me and nurtured it in the right way. Because, you know, when you're with our youth, like you could get excited about money, but if you don't have, if it's not aligned, if you don't have true purpose surrounding that, um, and if you don't have your bigger goals attached to that, then you're just going to go wherever money can go, can come to you quick. And so my parents. So, let me ask this: were, were you vocal about that with your parents at a very young age? Like, I was. Were, you, were you telling them? Okay. I was, and they saw. So, um, uh, so my dad is very frugal, right? And so I always had to. So, like, when the ice cream man would come, everybody would run in the house and go get money, and my dad be like, "What do you need money for?" 
And how much do you need? And I just gave you some the other day. And I'm like, the ice cream man is about to leave. Like, <laughs> I can't keep going through this, this conversation every time I need money. So that was number one. I was like, note to self, note to my five-year-old self. I will get my own money. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I could figure this thing out because by the time I'm coming back outside, the ice cream man is pulling up. Right. We were and we were all in my neighborhood, you know, from in Southwest Atlanta, whether I was at my grandmother's house, my parents' house, right. Green, Green Briar or Beecher Road, you know, we were always on the mid to the bottom level. It was yep. never like Choco Tacos or the, or the things that were at the top with the smiley face. None of right. our ice cream had any smiley face. Right, right. Because that was the $2 ice cream or the $1.50. <laughs> fifty. You had to get that red, blue, and white pop that was 25 cents. <laughs> and then it'll melt and then it'll all be one color. Like, hey, man, what's wrong with <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And so, um, so yes, so then, so early on, I started trying to figure that out. And so my parents had to reel it back in because I started trying to sell things in the house. I'd be like, oh, here goes, like, here goes a box of soap. I'm about to take it. I mean, just, I dived into it. And, and my neighborhood supported supported it like they shouldn't have been but they were like here comes Nicole what you selling today and I'd be like I got soap I got a thing of uh, uh, this Russian liquid <laughs> all the type of stuff um you know I, oh. I would watch tv and see you know you would get inspired by like watching Charlie Brown and seeing them do lemonade stands the next day I'll have a lemonade stand outside just all those different things. My my childhood friends now, and I'm so glad we all are still very much in touch with each other, but they always said they saw that so early in me because, you know, like, and then it was one time, uh, I think it was after Christmas, I ended up getting like the best bike, the 12 speed bike before everybody got the 12 speed bike. And so everybody in the neighborhood wanted to ride it. And I was like, great, $2 a ride, go back to your parents and tell them, yes, that's, what, that's when it had went too far. And so my parents sat me down and was like, okay, let's, let's understand what's happening here. And let's understand like, okay, so why do you want more money? What do you want to do with this money? How are you, how are you being blessed? You got this 12 speed bike. How are you being blessed to be a blessing? Right? So mm -hmm. how, so some of the kids who did not get things, how is this your opportunity to bless them? Yes. And then I was like, oh, okay. Like, I didn't understand that side of it. And that's why I say I give I give my parents so much credit in um, passing down generational wealth mindset mm -hmm. because you can fall in love with money and lose your reasoning behind everything. And that just means you're spiritually broke, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're spiritually wealthy, then you're able to continue bringing in all the blessings you need because you're doing it to further your purpose here on this earth. So... So those were times and moments that, that happened. But then also I tell people too, what was really great about being in Southwest Atlanta is even though I didn't, you know, I came from College Park, uh, you know, very humble beginnings, but my parents surrounded me around so much black excellence and black wealth mm -hmm. that I never thought that black people couldn't be wealthy. Like it never crossed my mind. Like, even meeting people later on in life and they would be like, wow, a black person has that. And I'll be like, I've only, I've only seen that growing yeah. up. I've only seen I we will, you know, drive up and down cascade and you would see these mega houses yeah. and it would just be beautiful black people, black families, little black girls, little black boys walking out of these houses. Um, you know, you went to a uh, maze and then Doug and all of these, and you would see these, high schoolers driving in the newest cars and their parents yeah. and you know I, I've seen black excellence since youth and it has um it has always empowered me on the inside that it's nothing that I cannot aspire to have or can't aspire to be it's just as I started getting older I was like you know what I need to understand how this works though I'm missing some of the language some of the language of money and um, some things is just, it's sounding foreign to me. So I need to fill in those gaps so I can be more powerful and, and gravitating towards this. But, um, as far as doubting it or feeling like it wasn't for me or feeling like it, it was no way it would happen. I didn't, I didn't have that because Southwest Atlanta just 
provided a, a landscape to see like fullest potential. Like even me, mm -hmm. my husband grew up in Florida mm -hmm. and he, even him, he was like, wow, we didn't really see black people do it like that. Like, right. you know, it wasn't common. You would, uh, of course you would see so many other ethnicities in Florida, you know, like, especially like Latinos, you would see, you know, white America, et cetera. They would be, you know, he would see wealth like Miami. Yeah wealth and you know palm beach is heavy heavy wealth oh, yeah. um, but as far as like just seeing tons and tons of black people that wasn't his that wasn't his norm and so when he moved to atlanta he was like wow <laughs> you know to me it was normal it was just like of course black people are rich like, mm -hmm. of course black people are wealthy of course black people are producing at the highest level i've never known it to not be um and that was just a that's something I want to personally instill in my child too. Like in my son, I want to put him around so much that the even if the world tells him it can't happen, he'll know better. That's good, Nicole. You know, the, the thing that you mentioned about the language of money, you know, so while we had this exposure uh, throughout our formative years to the many different, you know, let's call it the spectrum of wealth or mm -hmm. the spectrum of things, right? Uh, that exposure is important, but that language, the ability to speak that and it become real to you is something that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of us don't, don't get yeah. you know, until later on in our years. Uh, but, but what was in, you know, your story, your formative years, it's awesome to hear this conversation about your parents taking this, not just approach to, to teach you certain things and show you certain things, but you being, and you use the word, uh, empowered by these things. Mm -hmm. And while you were young, you know, it's interesting how those stories kind of stick with us and they manifest themselves in different ways when we reach what we call our independence. Right. So let's right. talk a little bit about that. So as you go through high school, you know, came out of Westlake, go to college, you know, did you still, or were you still, you know, very involved in entrepreneurship and things. You know how college can be your freshman, sophomore year in a new yeah. place because you're at Georgia State, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So I went to college knowing I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Okay. I, that, that seed that was planted very early in life just grew and it built a fire inside of me where even at first when I was in high school, <clears throat> And I was considering, you know, we started taking SATs and you start your plan. And I started talking to my parents and just even being like, do I even really want to go to college? Because I know I want to work for myself. My dad was like, well, what do you want to be? And I was like, uh, I don't know that part yet, but I know I want to work for myself. And he was like, well, you're going to go to college until you figure out, you know, what it is that you want to be. And there's so many resources in college to help you get there. So I went to college with the purpose of owning my own business. And back then that sounded crazy. Now it's entrepreneurship programs and yeah. you know specialties and schools for entrepreneurship and all of that. And I want to say we're not old, but even back, even then that was like not getting a real job or not, you know, using your time to its highest potential. Um, and so it was, it was actually quite interesting to, um, take an entrepreneurship path. And I just really had some great mentors in college that helped direct me and my skill set towards PR. Um, I was good at writing. I was good at connecting people. Uh, I was very, very creative, good at doing events, all of those different things. And so I had some mentors that, that really guided me. Um, which is why any anybody, high school, college, and I, I'll keep on saying this as long as I can, mentorship is so important because as someone investing and taking time to see you win, a little bit more than your counselors, unless you have a very involved counselor, mm -hmm. but if you could surround yourself with a mentor, um, and, and this is the thing, because people are like, well, how do you get mentors now and those different things? you'd be surprised how nice people are to you when you're in high school and you're in college, right? Oh. Like high schoolers and college kids reach out to me all the time. And because I was there, I'll take a moment to, to respond back. 
Mm-hmm. Now, if you 40 something years old and you send me a message and I'm like, you could have Googled that, then I, <laughs> I might just swipe past. But <laughs> for, 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 for next generation, I'm always, always going to pay back to that. So um, I had some people that directed me into that, really wanted to get into entertainment, um, started inter- um, uh, interning at Radio One. Okay. Uh, then Def Jam opened up Def Jam South in Atlanta, and, and I, I led a lot of like their movie tours and um, you know concert promotions and all those different things. Graduated and real well, got to the end of my um, college years and realized I did not like entertainment like that. Okay. Um, as, as as far as where I wanted to see my life go, I knew I wanted family and I knew I wanted children, and everybody in entertainment to me that I was surrounded around, everybody was like selling their souls to, to get further and further up in entertainment. So I didn't want to take that route. Let, and, let me ask you this, uh, Nicole. So th- that pivot away from that particular side of PR, was there a time during college where you thought of pivoting away from entrepreneurship or was this just always this driving force? In that? Always, always the driving force. Now I will say, after being an entrepreneur and after some hard years, then I started to have moments where I was like, is this for me, et cetera. But yeah. all the way through college, I definitely, I had not seen the, the hard times of entrepreneurship yet to even want to pivot. It was all, you know, like what's hard in college? Like, you know, everybody's broke. Everybody's eating ramen noodles. This, that's all cute. In, in your 20s, it, when you got to do that later, in your late 20s and your 30s, it's not cute mm-hmm. <laughs> anymore. Mm-hmm. So, and, and, and being with Def Jam South, look, y'all, y'all swinging for the fences. Yeah. Y'all playing around, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, so yeah, that, that that's when I, my last year of college, when I started my PR agency, I changed my voicemail on my cell phone to say, you reached the desk of Nicole Garner. Um, my voicemail- You were doing that too? I remember I had a 1-800 number. Uh huh. With, with the live voice- answer, yeah. it's like, hey, hey, you reached Mr. Clay. Hey, look, man, we. <laughs> My voice is still the same to this day. Like, uh, oh, really? Years, yes. Uh, yeah. Years later, 15 years later. Uh, my friends would think it was a joke. They would call and be like, you don't have no business. What is this? <laughs> such and such. And um, hey, now- listen, so, so the service I had, they transcribe all the messages. <laughs> like, I get all of these blank messages all the time because sure. people would be calling. And like, what is Greg up to? Like, I literally had a one eight hundred number. Right, right. Cause you, cause you saw your greatness then. Like, you manifested it yeah. years back. I, did I don't know if it, I was just really. I was look. You know how it is when you're young. Yeah. You know, everybody giving out their number. I want a one eight hundred. It was, it was what I don't even want to go down that path. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was good though. It it, it set good. it set the tone for where you were going with life. Um, yeah. So I started my my agency then. Uh, an internship I had, um, we ended up working with Delta and the program I was given was to get young black boys interested in aviation. Okay. So um, mm-hmm. so I had to basically, the agency that I was interning for, they were like, well, Nicole, just, you know, put it out there in a few places. Let's see what we can get. I ended up getting like five to 600 young black boys signed up for this program. Ended, ended up getting them flown out to the uh, Aviation Smithsonian, got them opportunities to um, to get the pilot experience, all this stuff. And it just made me feel so good because I was like, these young black boys pr- probably would have never had the, the chance to experience this. And now a good amount of them are gonna go into the space of aviation, which is, you know, if that's what they love, then this is beautiful. So I got ready to graduate. And the agency called me and was like, hey, we're just gonna give you this account. Like, we're gonna, we're gonna hire you out. You're gonna be an independent contractor with us. Send us over your EIN number, send us over your W9. We'll get you in the system as a vendor. And we look forward to, you know, work with you in this role. And I was like, perfect, I'll get you everything over. I hung so up Delta, so Delta was the first big client. Well, it was the agency that had Delta as a client. Mm-hmm. Look, 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 okay. I mean that that too. <laughs> And so, um, so I hung up the phone with them and then I got on the computer at school and was like, okay, so what is an EIN? Uh, really? How do I set up my, my business bank account? Like just getting it going. And before I graduated, I had my first large client. 
Awesome. But also another seed that was planted in me in college was my pivot towards understanding finances. It was, um, it was my junior year. I went home for spring break with one of my good friends um, that I knew she was very, I knew she was very wealthy, but it just wasn't something we talked about a lot. Um, you know, she, she was with our whole little crew. We were all from like Southwest Atlanta. So she, she just never bragged about it or, you know, anything. And she was like, won't you come on with me for spring break? And I was like, cool. You know, like, I mean, I, I loved being around her, everything. We pull up to our house and it was basically a, a full blown mansion, you know, of another level. And I was like, okay what's this? <laughs> and she was like, this is my house. And I was like, oh, you got money, money. <laughs> hey, like, you got money. Hey, man. <laughs> and we, I mean, her family was just as loving and everything. Mm. And I remember being in there and just the conversations they were having were so different, right? Like her dad was like, don't forget to stop by the wealth manager's office before you guys leave to go back to school because we need to update some things um, now that you're about to be 21. And they were talking about, you know, we were eating dinner. They were all talking about the family business and how, you know, it, how was she feeling getting ready to graduate? Is she going to be ready to take over some different things? And, you know, her and her brother and um, her grandmother was talking about uh, the estate and uh, just the will and trust. It was all these conversations that were just so normalized in their home. And I remember sitting back like, I don't, I don't know what anybody's talking about. Like, I don't even, I'm sitting here like with my phone trying to figure out some of the terminology and how does this apply to me? Am I missing out on something? Do I need to be having these talks with my family? Do we have a wealth manager? Nobody's so, ever mentioned that to me. To your me. point earlier, it's a different language. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I was like, I don't remember us talking about a wealth manager. Maybe I need to go ask that. Like, it's just all these different things. I remember we were driving back and I was real quiet. And she was like, why are you so quiet? Everything okay? I was like, yeah, girl, I just got a lot on my mind. But sitting there thinking like, oh, I, I have missed out on uh, a, a large conversation happening around me. Mm -hmm. And I need to plug in now. So I remember just really starting to become very tunnel vision on understanding what I didn't understand. And I was like, you know what? Um, I feel like my environment, my circumstances, my family, everyone's taken me as far as they could take me in this journey. Now I need to start reaching out, connecting with other people. I started getting, a, I got a financial mentor. I started reading every book on finances. You know, a lot of us start with like the Dave Ramsey's and, you know, those different things, which some of the stuff now later on in life, I recognize that it's void of like, cultural sensitivity but still just even starting to get your brain working around some of those things and um understanding uh, how money works and how you know currency is energy and and what you're going to what you're going to do with that and the importance of generational wealth it was just so many different things that i started falling in love with and um you know i just had to get very confident in and how I could change the trajectory for my own family. That's that's where that's where it all started for me. Like let, how let me, I, sure, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. But let me ask you this because you know you again the the PR space. I, now that you're in the the financial space, right? Like you are. I mean, literally in it. Mm -hmm. When you were in the PR space, was this like always tugging at you? It, it was, it, and and I'm still I'm still in the PR space too. Well, yeah, I know, but you yeah. know, well, I know you you in all spaces, right? You doing you doing it all. <laughs> but it 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 always has tugged at me. It has always been conversations, okay. um, and so even when I was in Atlanta, and I'll tell you when I officially started to make the pivot. When I was uh, in Atlanta, I opened up a co working space. It was called Open for Business. It was on Opera Avenue. And that's because I really believed in like reverse gentrification, right? Like I, mm -hmm. I've had businesses on Old National. I've had businesses on Opera Avenue, like anywhere where it's just very blacky, black, black, black. And I know that there's so much greatness there. That's where I, I always plant roots. Mm -hmm. And so um, in this space, I had the beauty of 
so many entrepreneurs in the city just coming, stopping by the space and me sharing space with these people. And it was, it was I'm telling you, y'all defined an era in, in, in the space. I mean, you had so many people that were, you know, thinking about investing on Arbor now. I, I, I think about, you know, Arbor Seafood, you know, which has since sunsetted. Um, mm -hmm. I think about, you know, Embar, shout out to Zay and, and Bachi. And, and I mean, it, it's just a different, and it's, and it's a shame that the city hasn't really turned this corner around supporting black businesses right. in, in this new age. And we, and we, we got to be critical about it because it just, it just hasn't been there. Right, right, but right. I, I remember that, you know, just thinking about that time where I come on Auburn Avenue and be around there for like six, seven hours. <laughs> I, wanted, <laughs> you know I wanted to see Auburn Avenue get, I, I, so many people live in Atlanta and don't know the history of Auburn Avenue. Sure. And Auburn Avenue was, was literally the Black Wall Street of America. It was the richest Black street, um, you know, for a certain time. And that is why so much has attacked that area because mm -hmm. it's, it's not just by happenstance. Like when you see a lot of the, the homelessness and drugs and everything, it was, I think it was purposely infiltrated into that space because just like Tulsa or just like, you know, any other area of greatness where you see a lot of black excellence, it was massively destructive, you know? And so I love the idea that it was all these young black entrepreneurs coming back to restore that, but it was hard because there was so much going on in that area without any police support or without the city support. And as a young business, you know, you can only but spend so much on security and you can only spend so much on other things. And so, you know, so many businesses collaboratively really wanted to see it win. And I still believe in that area. I, I actually yeah. donate to uh, uh, Auburn Avenue Restoration Project right now. Just, I just got to see that area come back to its greatness. And I just want to be a part of it in some type of way. But so, so back to what I was saying, I had this, this space on Auburn Avenue and it became a place where I could just share space with so many entrepreneurs. And I thank God to this day that people can be very transparent with me. You know, like I don't, you know, I'm always very aware. I hope that I give off that I have had a long journey too. You know, like I never... You know, there's some people who just are are being introduced to me now. And this is where, this is the part of my life. My dad calls it your, like my spring or where everything looks good. You know, like mm -hmm. married, child, house, you know, such and such. Like it, it looks good. But Lord, those years leading up to it was, <laughs> it was a journey. It was a journey, you know, and. Um, without any shortcuts, right? Without, without any shortcuts, without you know. Uh, and even when you try to take shortcuts, because I don't know I try to take shortcuts, <laughs> God would like, you know, the lessons in that, right? Yeah, it was a true journey. And even, you know, even being from Atlanta, sometimes you had to prove yourself to Atlanta again, you know, like it was a constant, I had to constantly prove myself, you know, when people move into Atlanta from out the city and they're like, well, I'm not from Atlanta, so it's harder for me. I was like, I promise you it was harder if you're from Atlanta, like you had to, you, it is hard to be a, a prophet in your own city, right? Like you got to go somewhere else, do big and then come back to it. That's every city, mm -hmm. you know, every community. So my journey was constantly having to, to push. And so I feel like if people have seen my, my journey, then they feel very open with talking to me and it would be, you know, you know, I work late. So I'll be in that office, 7 PM, 8 PM. And people will stop by and be like, Hey, Nicole, can can we just talk for a minute? Sure. And it would be like, you know, I started my business. I jumped out there into entrepreneurship, like everybody says you should do. And I quit my nine to five. And now I'm about to get, you know, I'm about to lose my house. Or um, I jumped out on faith. Like everybody always says, don't look back and, you know, leave your job if you really want to do it. And now I'm about to get evicted out of my boutique. Or, you know, it was, it was one too many of those conversations where I was like, we're not having the right conversations about entrepreneurship in this city. 
right? Everybody's moving to Atlanta to become an entrepreneur. Everybody wants to be a, wants to be an entrepreneur, but we aren't talking about money. <laughs> we're talking about everything else. We're talking about branding and websites and photo shoots and mm-hmm. who you connect with and what red carpet you on and um, how, you know, get Nicole to do your PR. And I'm like, Ooh, before we talk about PR, like, we need to talk about cash flow, mm-hmm. you know, like we need to talk about how this, the, the job shaming that was happening in Atlanta, that was like an era. I, I, it looks like it's starting to go away, which thank God. But it was I don't like, know, like, but go ahead. I don't know. It's kind of, it, it's, start, it's not as bad as it used to be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, where people used to be embarrassed to say they still had a job, mm-hmm. but I'm like, listen, if that's your job is your investment. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's your first investor to to your dream. Why are you in such a rush to leave it? Just because someone stood on the stage and said, that's what you're supposed to do. Have you seen their bank account statements? Do you know like that, that their own advice has worked for them? How are we putting ourselves in these predicaments based on these gurus that, you know, are putting themselves on these stages, but without really telling the truth? Like the yes, truth. The- and that, that is, Nicole, I think the essence of not just why these type of conversations are important, these platforms are important, but we've got to, to your point, turn this corner, not just in Atlanta, but I think across the country to where we've got to say this season of all of those things where the truth really isn't present, where there hasn't been this fruit that people can eat and become healthy from it. There's been fruit from these certain trees that people are eating, thinking that you know it's nutritious, but it it's not even it's not even making people whole, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I think I think we've got to pump these types of conversations into that space yeah. in order for people to not believe the lies, because yeah. where where the truth isn't present, there are lies. There yeah. is there is this room for you know, where, where there's not any godliness and righteousness, you know, the devil thrives, right? And so to even to mention faith, you know, that's why it's so important for, for I think, you to not just hear, but all the time, tell that total truth. You have, um, I always say, Greg, you have one of the best um, guy circles that I've seen. Like your whole group is so <laughs> impressive and productive and mm-hmm. really dig deep into the community. But you have one friend, um, Jay Bailey, who I just feel like what he does for Black people is just so amazing. But he said this statement one time just about how our community, um, we need to be in a space of building as we climb, right? And that's, I, I believe that's like his tagline, you know, at this point. Mm-hmm. And I know, and I see you, you live by that motto too. And mm-hmm. so, you know, being in that space on Auburn Avenue, I started to realize like, there is a lot of people in the city climbing, but no one's building. Like mm-hmm. we're not building each other. We're not um, telling each other the truth. We're not show, showing our our bad times, our failures, our, you know, all the other things that happen to us in the process of that. And that is when I think that I really found my voice in speaking up on in the financial side. That's when I started to get my certifications. That's when I started to get licensing. That's when I started to be like, okay, I do have a voice. I'm actually pretty loud. (laughs) How can I use this voice to leave more of an impact and to really help my community? Um, Which I've always been very, very passionate about black people, right? Since the beginning. And even on my PR side, I've always taken on projects and worked with entities that that the sole purpose was how can we empower the black voice, which is still my 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 passion and purpose to this day. Um, I didn't just wake up in, in 2020 once we started protesting. Like I I have been very strong stance in that space since youth. You know, like that's that's just been something that's been impressed upon me since youth, and so. I started really asking myself, how do I leave a bigger impact on this earth? Like, how do I take what I've been given and and use it to to push our community forward? 
And what I started to realize too, in the financial spaces, you had all these gurus who were speaking and no one was taking into account the generational, the, the um, racial wealth gap, um, cultural uh, entities that, that play a role into where people are with their finances, yeah. um, financial trauma. Like I, I do this little micro podcast called Profitable Existence. I had a um, psychotherapist on my podcast the other day who specializes in poverty trauma. And I don't even think that we talk about these things in our community enough, mm -hmm. right? Like if you grew up dealing with extreme poverty, like you might come home and the lights might be off. You might come home, come home and all your stuff is out on the street. You got to hurry up and move. You might have been told that money's evil your entire life. Um, you might have saw how money made your parents divorce, any of these type of things, right? So you get, so you plug in these narratives of, of what money means to you or what money represents. And that's how you start to carry it out in your adult life. And so you have all these financial gurus who was just saying like, just do better, <laughs> right? Like that would be their advice. Like I did it, you know, my parents, you know, moved from, from wherever they made it over here. They made it happen. They bootstrapped their way. And so just do it. And I'm like, it's not that easy, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's not that easy um, when, you're, when you're dealing with trauma and, you know, so many other things, right? And even like, even if you come from a family, like some of my uh, clients now that I, I do financial coaching for. Like if you come from a family, let's say that your family is from Africa. They, they took everything they had to get you over here to get you in school. <clears throat> for you, you might feel like you owe your family all of your money for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Like how do you get into a space of setting up boundaries and those different things? And, you know, one of my clients was like, they, you know, used to go to a lot of the, the, um, these financial gurus conferences and things. And, you know, their advice would be like, just cut your parents off. And it's like, if you come from a communal family, right. You can't just cut your parents off. Sure. Right? And, sure. and then you feel a sense of, you do feel a sense of being indebted if they spent their everything to get you over here to, to get you these, sure. you know, experiences you have. So you, I just saw that there was that conversation wasn't there. And then also I really saw that I, with so many black people, we got to a space of we could talk about anything. We talk about relationships. We talk about sex. We talk about health. We talk about politics, but people just couldn't talk about money, mm -hmm. you know, outside of bragging, sure. outside of you know, the, the, the Atlanta way, right? Mm -hmm. You know, look at mm -hmm. my new condo, look at my new mm -hmm. Maserati or, you know, whatever outside of that. But like, how could you, like, let's say for instance, Greg, if you just bought a house and you have, a, you have someone in your circle who's looking in the same neighborhood, he should be able to call you and say, hey, how much did you guys spend on your house? Mm -hmm. What are some things that, you know, I should ask for? Um, what are some things that you might have done to make your clothing cost less? Or what's a realtor that you worked mm -hmm. with that got you the best deal? Or, you know, just these type of conversations instead of how we used to feel where it was like, you know, stay out of my pockets. Don't worry mm -hmm. about what's in my purse. Don't ask, you know, you don't ask people about money. Yes, we do. That's what we need to do. That is what other um uh, groups and other groups of individuals do. They talk about money. They go out, they golf, they go out to eat. They come over each other's houses. They, whatever it takes, they have these open and honest conversations about money and they build in that way. And I think that we had got to this point of being so, um, being so stuck in this place of, we can't discuss this because it's not right. It's not proper. It's being nosy is taboo, whatever that is. So if anything, my whole goal is just to make sure we normalize having these conversations and we normalize talking about it. We get to a space where I could be like, Greg, how much did you pay for your house? Without you being like, do I ask you how much you pay for your house? Like, it, it should just, you know, before we even get there, it should be like that. One of the things I want to, to, to throw away in Nicole, because I think we're going in a really, really awesome direction with this. Uh, one of the things that, that helped me out regarding that was 
like you said, having these these relationships with folks like Jay and my inner circle of friends, people that I, I mean, I prayed to the Lord a long time ago for good people that I could trust and be around yeah. and have these types of conversations. It, it hadn't been easy, but and I've really got a, a, just a blessed you do. In the inner, outer, free circle, and yeah. you know, it's by the grace of God. It's, and, good, it's good to see Black men connect like that, too. I always say that men need men. Women need women, right? Mm -hmm. like, we'll, we'll all, you know, collaboratively, I think for the Black family, we, and, and for, for Black wealth, we all mm -hmm. desperately need each other. But there are certain times where you just need to go and be, and be restored and be, um, uplifted by your by your male peers and so it's, it's great to see that Re restored is the word right so let's start from there so this this restoration that you get through these therapeutic conversations this trust this exchange from folks that that really was a tipping point for me and my growth if you know putting myself to the side and saying hey i've got to be able to talk about this type of stuff with my friends Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, as I inched into this space years ago with friends, we all became more comfortable in having those types of conversations because it wasn't, it wasn't the shame associated with it now, you know, it, it wasn't this, uh, well, I don't know what I'm doing with my money. How could you not know what you're doing with your money? It, it's, it's this, we all want to see each other, to your point, win in this space. Yeah. And if we aren't able to talk about these things, even if I don't have what you have, how can I be vulnerable enough to talk about it, to grow through it, and get this restoration in it? Because once you got the information, you also kind of apply it as well. Right, right, right. And people keep you accountable to it. It's, it's the same way we were talking about, you know, health, right? It's no you just don't you just don't know the conversation we even had about our own health journeys. Yeah. Inspired yeah. me to even say, you know what, I talked with G Money, you know what I mean? Like he, well, folks I call the code G Money, right? And so it, there's this there's this piece of that that we can all take with us and trying to inspire and empower each other. Yeah. So you know what? I don't need to buy this, or I do need to invest more in this, or I do need to read this, I don't need to waste time doing that. Nicole, talk to, talk to people about how valuable that is. If, if folks say, you know what, I don't have people in my circle that I can do that with, you know, what's your advice to those folks that might be watching or listening? To, to, to so, so one, I, I never feel like any day of your life is permanently set in stone that you can't put energy into it and change it into the direction you want it to be, okay. right? So you might wake up or you might be watching this uh watching this show right now and you might say hey I don't have these people around me okay so when when we had when we get off of this you grab yourself a pen and paper you say what characteristics of people are you seeking you start listing some people that you feel like this would be beautiful to be in the space of these people and then also working on yourself like what makes these people want to be in the space of you too <laughs> right you know like you, it has to be even exchanged right it's it's no way that greg could be in this amazing circle if he didn't bring amazingness himself it was no way i could be in a lot of the friend circles that i'm in if i did not bring value myself too um and and that because people don't want to feel like they're being used as well they don't want to feel like they're being exploited or being used so when it's a when it's a collaborative share of value information and love then you know, it's a win-win for everybody involved. Um, so I, I definitely feel like you can, you can start to align yourself in that. Um, I have a membership, it's called the Common Commonwealth Membership with Amount Financial, where we have a lot of these resources, talks, um, just a group of individuals who are wealth positive. And sometimes you gotta start the journey with strangers, right? And those end up becoming some of your best friends because you're aligned on where you're trying to go with your life. So you have those opportunities too, just putting yourself in those groups, um, surrounding yourself with those people, letting organic relationships happen where they will and just being intentional. Um, I was even talking to you about the Clubhouse app and I've just been on some great, you know, in some great rooms on that app and I connect if someone says a word, like if they give a whole sermon, I'm like, listen, let me connect with them. I'll, you know, uh, follow back up through instant, instant message or 
DMs or whatever it is, but you know, in- I gotta go ahead and get my iPad going so I can take advantage of my invites. You have to, girl. You gotta come on, come on in. But yeah, um, Andrew, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know what's going on. I'm just gonna get go get the Android, take go get the iPad and just say, hey man, go ahead and just, just let me on in the door. Right, right, right. But um but I hear about it so much, but but even if you aren't in that space, you know, to your point, this alignment of even when we talk about energy, because we've talked about energy in the past, right? Yeah. Yeah. It it is it is real, folks. Yeah. When we talk about the energy that you put up and focusing on yourself, positive thoughts, pushing through. It's not make believe stuff, man. It it is. I mean, I'm a subscriber. I'm a yeah. full time subscriber, Nicole. And when you when you, I think this is great for black men, black women, black babies. When you start to put that alignment in one area of your life, it comes into other areas of your life, right? When you start getting intentional about where you want your life to be, who you want to be around, how you want to live, um, how you want to experience life in one area, then the other areas start to come come together too. So um, we were talking before we got um, before we went live, just about how with our health journeys, you know, just the energy we've both been putting into it. And I told Greg, he looks, Greg looking a good 18, 19 years old now, <laughs> which is amazing. But um, you as well, Nicole, man. I mean, it, it's been, it's been awesome to see. No, I, still, I, I got auntie vibes, but it's cool. I'm going to embrace my auntie. <laughs> I was, uh, I was watching, uh, when I was on Lil Duval's page, and he said that um, your auntie wants you to turn 35. So I was like, okay, let me go ahead and embrace my auntie. But he's like, you don't admit it till you're 40. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and embrace my auntie is a, but I'm gonna I'm be a healthy auntie. But yeah, just, you know, the, the same energy that you put into um, and, and discipline and intentionality and um, non-toxic behavior that you put into your financial side of your life it shows up in your family life it shows up in your health life it shows up in your spirituality it just shows up in all those different areas like when you can how you do things in one area is how you do things in all areas and the more i got intentional with a lot of things in certain parts of my life i was able to take that behavior and transcend it to other areas of my life and it's just it's made a difference. It's, this year has been a very blessed year for me, but it's it's because I have been working towards that. It's, it's not like magic happened and out the blue 2020 became a great year for me. It's because I've been planting seeds. I've been working at things. I've been um, putting energy into things. I've been working at my 10,000 hours. You know, they say 10,000 hours gets you to that level of expert. I've been working at my 10,000 hours in a few different areas of my life. Continuously will be working at them. And then, you know, I'll go for my 20,000 hours after that. Um, it's just, a, it's a journey that you continue. How, how have you dealt with getting rid of uh, the term that you used earlier where uh, it was uh, unnecessary mandates? How, how have you worked on getting rid of some of those and just how you've been pushing forward in the last, you know, three, six months? So, um, That's I like that unnecessary mandates. I don't know if you created that, but I, I like that that oh, the way yeah. to frame that conversation is. You know, it's 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 an interesting thought pattern. You know, that's why I want to follow up with it. Yeah, I said that in 2020, leading up to 2020, we had a lot of mandates that we all lived in, right? Where we thought that we had to do things, behave in a certain way, participate in a certain way because we thought there was just no other option to doing so. And then when 2020 came around and we had to sat down <laughs> and, and slow it all the way down, we realized um, a lot of these things were just unnecessary. You know, there was this meme that went around. I sent it to um, my dad the other day that talked about, um, there was a person that wrote, I can't believe I used to leave my house five days out the week. That just seems so unnecessary now. Uh, you know, for people who still get that opportunity to work from home or, or you know, at least be in that hybrid space. 
And, you know, I was like, there were so many of those light bulbs that went off this year. I um, have operated in a space of busyness for a long time. That busyness felt like normalcy to me. Um, so I was one of those people at the beginning of the pandemic that was like freaking out, like, oh my gosh, it's going so slow. <laughs> you know, where is this going? What's happening? And then I, then I started to just find peace with all of it. And in that peace, I started to realize there were some, some gaps I needed to fill, some holes that I needed to plug back up, some, some steps that I had skipped, some areas I needed to reprioritize. There was just so much that that, sl that mandatory slowdown had to happen for me to, you know, just plug away at, especially in just some of my other areas of life. And so it turned into being a, a big blessing. And we were talking about the unnecessary mandates because I said I was reading this article that talked about a lot of people in Silicon Valley are starting to move to like Florida and move to other areas of places they really want to live. That's way more affordable and just gives them a better quality of life because now they realize you can work from home, right? The You probably are more productive from home. Money is still being made. Businesses are still hitting their numbers. If not, they're doing even better. All these things are happening um, outside of the confinement of the way we thought things had to go. And, you know, at, at, now, albeit 2020 is definitely hard for many people. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking away from that. And it's been, it's been hard for our family too, because we've experienced some transitions of life in our own family, you know. Um, but in the midst of all the lessons, I, I just like to be reminded to take the good lessons too out of it. You know, there, I mean, it's been a crazy year, but it definitely was a chance to live life more on your own terms. Like all these things we kept telling ourselves, if I just had more time, I would do this. Now you have more time, would you do it? If I ate, if I ate home instead of eating out all the time, I would lose the weight. Okay, so now you are eating at home. Mm -hmm. Now you just, now you're, you're having to see like, what really is the problem or what really is, is it that you're looking at in the mirror? Like mm -hmm. you're having to really sit down and deal with you and it could be rough, but it could be so beautiful on the other side. Mm -hmm. Nicole, I want to ask you something. This is a question I can ask uh, everybody, right? Because some folks, you know, God bless everybody, but folks, you know, you can talk about this level, this level, this level, you know, some folks ain't up, you know, out the screen, right? I was, I was having a conversation with someone uh, last week about, you know, just growth, right? And when people make the decision about, um, you know, finally pivoting on something, because that's, that's really, the series has been talking thoroughly through that. And I wanted to ask you, you know, someone that's watching this that wakes up tomorrow and says, you know what, after listening to Dr. Nicole Garner Scott, I'm gonna put energy on this thing. You know, what's your advice to that person on the second day? You know, on the, the second the, day, on the on the second day that they wake up and, and and they after they said, hey, I'm gonna make up my mind. I'm gonna get this thing right. You know how it is when folks say, you know, I got this new energy and I'm gonna go back to my. You know, what's your what's your advice to that person that says, you know, when I wake up Monday, I'm gonna get to it with this new energy. What, what would you say to that person they should be doing on Tuesday and maybe even Wednesday, you know? So, so definitely as the days go by, always act like it's your first day. So that energy, that excitement, that reasoning, all of that, even when you get to your 10,000th day, you should still wake up and act like it's your first day. Um, two, I would figure out what are all the things that are triggers to me and how can I properly prepare for those triggers so that it doesn't all the way take me out, right? So mm. you already know that um, getting a rejection is a trigger, right? Because you're going to get rejection. Like that's just part of doing business. Like, everybody's not going to think you're amazing. You know, all, you just got to know that you're amazing because you know you're amazing. And, and you know, people are going to be like, I'll, I'll buy what you have, I'll pay for what it is you're offering, or I'm not interested. If you don't deal with rejection well, what is, what is your, your positive 
what are things in your positive toolkit that can restore you back in that moment, right? Is it is it that you need to to have affirmations sitting in front of you? Is it that you need to have a talk with somebody? Do you need to watch a video? You, you know, any of those type of things in your in your positive toolkit? Do it's you really to practical. Your positive toolkit, writing down those things that restore you. Yep. So yep. in the thick of it, you can go right back to it. I yep. like that. Because outside of it, you're gonna be like, oh, okay, well, I should just quit. You know, nobody, I, I'm only on day two. Nobody really knows what I'm up to. Um, I haven't put it all the way out there, et cetera. If I just stop what I'm doing now, you know, nobody will ever know. But then also nobody will ever be aware of the greatness that was supposed to come from it too. Um, so having that positive toolkit, knowing what your triggers are. Um, I know it's cliche, but defining what your why is, like really digging into what's that why, um, for me, it's what am I doing for my last name, right? Like when you understand you're bigger and you understand you're greater and you understand your higher calling, then the small things make sense. It's like, of course this would happen because I'm going for greatness, right? Like if you're an athlete and you're training, of course this would happen. Of course, like you would get hurt because you're going for greatness. So that just brings you back to refocusing, retargeting, figuring out what's the small things that I tried to skip over that I need to, you know, get back into doing. Um, who, what type of training do I need to do? You know, like I, I read a lot on Serena Williams. She's just, her mindset, like her and LeBron, they talk about their mindsets a lot, not just the sport itself. And one thing that Serena talks about a lot is she trains to make sure that she doesn't get injuries, right? Not necessarily to become a better player um, or not to, you know, become the finest thing out there or any of those things. She trains to make sure she doesn't get injuries. And so in your space, when you're constantly running through your mind, your bigger why, um, what are you doing for your last name? What are you doing for your bloodline? that's helping you train for the injuries, uh, for the potential, to keep you from experiencing the potential injuries as you're going down your, your path of, of your pivot. Um, another part too with pivoting is that people deal with embarrassment a lot or what are people gonna think? <clears throat> Even in my pivot, and trust me, I still feel like I'm young enough that you guys might see another two, three, four pivots happen before Let's this go. is said and done, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. <laughs> You know, like, I, I, I just believe in that. Like when you, when you see people who are very wealthy, they weren't so tied to one thing. They weren't emotionally tied to one business. You pick it up, you sell it. If it makes sense to sell it, you get out of it. If it's not, you know, if it's not, it's time you scale it, you bring in a CEO. I mean, you, you, you make the move that makes the moves. And so you know, stick around and, and, and we're friends on social media. Who knows? Like by the time I get to my fifties, it might be something new. And in my sixties, something else new, who knows? You know, like Biden is, uh, how old is Biden? Se old. 69, 79, somewhere. Old. Yes. And ran for president. And so listen, you know, me at 78, 79, who knows what's going to happen? I, you know, like I'm going to keep going for greatness all the way to the end. That's why I focus on my health, like what we were talking about. That's why I focus on my 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 wealth, putting my money in the right places. That's why I focus on my spirituality and my mental mindset, because I'm I'm riding this thing all the way to the wheels fall off. And being um, around to to the, I, I don't get this advice like in addition to that. Be want to be around folks like that, y'all. Yeah. You know, folks that just aren't talking about growth and growing. You know, how they, how they going how are you gonna talk in the same wavelength as somebody when you in this growth pattern around trying to improve yourself and they keep pulling you back in like yeah yeah, yeah. how's that helping you you yeah. know yeah that's not that's not helping you on that second or third day you know that positive toolkit you know I know it might seem safe to go back to some of those things you know but I'm gonna write that positive toolkit down. Um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned with the sports analogy, I'm finishing up this book, uh, Relentless, 
and they talk a lot about closers and cleaners. That's his term of cleaners when you're talking about LeBron James as well. Uh, I'm, I'm going to throw that book out to you. Okay. You know, and I'll text that to you. And for folks that let me know if you've read that book, Relentless. I'm finishing it up. But when, when you're talking through that around training regimens, how he talks about D Wade, Michael Jordan, mm -hmm. um, training training to not get hurt and the, the, the intent behind that, I want to throw that out to you as a, as a you know, book. Okay. You know. And, and I know you got a list of things that you're reading. Yeah, I mean, that, and, and I watch and I listen. I have a two-year-old son, so sometimes I had to consume my content in different ways. So anytime I'm on the road, I'm listening to a podcast. Oh, um, Audible. Oh, yeah, Audible. It's yeah, like yeah. 97%. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I figure, you know, people are like, I have so much going on in life. I don't have time to read. You can figure out how to digest that content in a multitude of ways. You just got to figure out what flows in your life, right? And so in... When I lived in Atlanta, I was on the road a lot. In Florida, I'm on the road a lot. The only time I wasn't on the road a lot was the, the two years that we lived in Memphis because everything was like, beep, beep, beep. you know, I would be in and out of the car in five minutes. But um, in Atlanta, I stayed in the suburbs. So I was going downtown. So I was always 25, 30 minutes on the road. Um, the same, I'm always taking my meetings in, in my office in the heart of Miami. So I'm always on the road, 25, 30 minutes. I get excited about being on the road. I get excited about being in traffic because I'm like, yes, I can. I could digest this whole book that I've been meaning to get to. Um, I've been trying to finish, you know, President Obama's book for the longest. It's thick. That thing long. It's thick. <laughs> it's thick. That thing long, man. It's thick. It's good, <laughs> though. Up. It's good, but hey, I've, I've been trying to finish it. Look, I, I started reading Relentless in that, and hey, look, I'm, yeah. I got three other books I'm trying to get done, and that, uh, I'm yeah. going to finish it. Yeah. I'm going to finish it before the year. Uh, Michelle and, uh, and, uh, Barack's book back over to Audible. I, I bought the hard covers because I just feel like they're they're legacy pieces to have in your house. Sure. And I started with trying to read both of them and then I took them back and I was like, let me just buy the Audible so I can get through these. Mm -hmm. um, but they're good. They're good. They just, <laughs> you know, when you presidential level. That the way, look, he talking. <laughs> I'm talking on the way that uh, it's awesome. Some, some consistencies around even our conversation related to what I'm hearing in that too. So it's it's confirming, right? Yeah. But like you said, your your individual talents and gifts, you know, you've got to uh, you know, stay committed to those things too. So what's what the name of Jordan's uh, documentary? Um, we were we were watching it all through the pandemic. You, you mean uh, the series? Uh, uh -huh. What was the name of it? Uh, I don't know why I just uh, forgot. I forget the name of it, but yeah, it's, I saw it for sure. Oh, yeah, it's, I saw it. It's so good to see but also i like last dance appreciate that thank you yes um <laughs> yeah we we horrible but we know we knew it though we watched it that's but all we went appreciate that it so good to see his journey but also what i love to see now and this is really good because i know you have a, a lot of black men that follow you greg is to see how important it is to have a holistic approach to your greatness now right because you can tell that jordan was completely tunnel vision in one way. And those tears that he had in a lot of his interviews were some of the regrets on the other side. He has no regrets on how he played the game, right? Cause he know he was a beast. Mm -hmm. But as far as his relationship with some of his, his teammates and um, just his relationships in his own life. You yeah, can family, see, personal life, yeah, sure. You can see that he wasn't able to give that energy there and that's something that I feel like is our generation is doing a really good job of recognizing that that all those different areas need your need your attention, right? Like our fathers and our fathers' fathers, our grandfathers, etc. Their one job was to go to work, get the money, and bring it home. How much they talked to you that was up for debate, and it wasn't even really required of the men in those former generations because going out into the world was too much to deal with. Like yeah. by the time you got called a boy from the time you set, set your foot outside the house, mm -hmm. dealing with straight ignorance at work, dealing with trying to figure out how to keep a roof over your head and then dealing with racism on the way back to home. Mm -hmm. It's like, let me just let this man be, right? <laughs> you know, like, let me let this man be. But now that there's, some level of because it's still hard right it's still oh, like, yeah. 
you're still coming on the news. You're still dealing mm -hmm. with stuff at, at work. You're still like, it's if, if it hasn't gotten even harder, just, just because people have started to forget how much was really transpiring, um, you know, in, in that space. But as and there's this there's this enlightenment associated with understanding that too, right. you know, to where it doesn't because you know I used to, and that's why I talk to and mentor. Uh, it's going to be forever be a part of me because there is a season in my life where uh, I was really angry, mm -hmm. unplugged from the system, you know, mm -hmm. and, and by the grace of God, I was able to get back on track. And I try to use my voice in that space, right, mm -hmm. to, to help folks. But what, what I, what, what, those who yeah. don't. Mm -hmm. But what I, you know, now as, a, as an adult, you know, using all of that information, not as anchors, but to empower and add fuel and motivation to thinking about things a different way, never forgetting that narrative and staying true to that narrative. Mm -hmm. But there's this enlightenment in that, that even has changed a lot of my behavior. You know, I was talking, you know, I talk a lot, I talk a lot, right? Um, you know, I, this this concept of, you know, having even your fourth eye open, you know, yeah. to where it's it's all positivity, it's all about building. I understand relationships or relationships. I understand that, uh, you know, there are disagreements at times, but we got to build. Yeah. You know, we got so much that we've sacrificed. We've got so much at stake. We've got so much heightened awareness around certain things. This enlightenment that tells us that, hey, when you're growing, when you're plugged in, when you're building, when we're talking about all the next things generation-wise that we have a responsibility to, uh, it, it's not about putting everything else to the side. It's just that we've got to be more intentional in this season related to our lineage in this country around yeah. building based on all of those things that you were talking about. These yeah. false narratives are out there, the smoke and mirrors, where it's not even smoke from a fire, it's coming from a smoke machine. You know what I mean? Like nothing's real. Smoke is not even real, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we've got to be able to say, turn the lights on, get that stuff out of there. What does this space need to, what does it need to have even in it in yeah. order to build and recognize what we, what we have and where we need to go? And that's why I was saying, if you, approach it from a holistic standpoint. If you if you take the life wheel and you're adding energy into all those different areas of your life, then it makes you do it from a, from a more organic and authentic place, right? So if you're, many of, I, I have a, a woman's mentorship program and many of my mentees, I'm always saying, hey, it is good. We're going to focus on business and we're definitely going to focus on money, but we're not going to figure, we're not going to forget these other areas of your life. Because if they're imbalanced, then these other areas are still, they can only still get to but a certain level. Because if your finances are doing great, but your marriage is falling apart, it's going gonna, it's gonna to leak over into that, right? Or if your marriage is doing great, but both of y'all aren't saving anything, and this pandemic could have took, it took a lot of people out. This, is, this has been the highest year of divorce, the highest year of domestic uh abuse, the highest year of domestic um, uh, breakups, uh, all these different things are happening. This is not by chance. This is because once the pressure is applied, you got to have these other things in life working for you too, right? Like money can't solve all issues. It can solve a lot though. So we're, gonna, we're not going to say we're not going to get money, but it, it can't solve all issues. Um, you know, marriage is not for everybody. Children don't miraculously make marriages work, right? You mm -hmm. know, like if marriage is not strong, then children can break that apart even more. So, sure. you know, don't let people pressure you into any any of those other things. Like you have to do all those things when you're ready for it and when it makes sense to your life. But yeah, just just agreeing with you on, we can see from those previous generations that you got to have a, a holistic approach. You got to tap into all those different areas of your life. Um, you you want to win from the inside. You want to have those all those different spaces making sense to the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nicole, listen, we we have you know I try to keep these things at an hour. This conversation has just been so awesome. <laughs> we, while we while we eclipsed that time mark, I, I wanted to make sure that you know for for those folks that are watching and for those folks that will. Uh, soon see or maybe even see this later on um 
Yeah, there's so much good in, in having conversations like these, you know, in relationships like these, because Nicole, you you could have been anywhere else, but you spent the time to to be vulnerable in this space and talk about your journey in this space. And not only to help me, but I know other folks that are watching this uh, will be enriched and enlightened as well. Uh, so I just want to take this time out to say thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we are extremely, extremely proud of you from the home team. As an ambassador of the home team, we are so, so proud of you, no matter where you are on God's green earth, even if you went Elon out there in Mars, you know, <laughs> no matter where you want to be in the middle always way. have property in Atlanta. And Atlanta will definitely be yes. what we return to when it's all said and done, because uh, it's too, it's too uh, much magic in, in the city to to ever leave for good. You indeed, know, I'm just indeed. out here collect, collecting gold to bring it back. No, 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 indeed, man. So proud of y'all. So proud of the fam. Tell artists to say what's up, man, and, and proud of what he's doing. Like, they, there are just so many different things that, um, you know, in your story, your narrative, and this is just one side or one glimpse into those things as you continue to, to produce content and bring these narratives to the table about financial wellness and this courage to tell your story. Uh, folks, just know that, you know, it's people like Nicole that continue to inspire me and are the reasons why these types of platforms are so important. And so, Nicole, please tell people where they can find you and connect with all the information that, yeah. that you'll continue to produce. Well, thank you guys for hanging in with us for after an hour and a half. You know, me and Greg, we're both from the South, so we can, we can talk, okay? <laughs> um, but you can- uh, The sandwich just magically appear. I start eating the you know, dinner <laughs> as we talk, you know what I mean? Like, right, right. We got, like, we got on a porch outside and just, and just talk it all out. Uh, which we need to all make happen. Like, tell your wife, I'll tell artists, we all need to get together at some point um, when it's safe again um, no and, and get those conversations happening in person. No doubt. But, um, yes, on Instagram, it's Dr. D.R. Garner, G-A-R-N-E-R -E Scott. Um, personal website is Nicole Garner Scott. And then it for my financial uh, coaching side, it's amountfinancial.com and at Amount Financial on every social media platform. Awesome. Well, hey, any last thoughts as we kind of close things out? I think that this was a great showing of going back and sitting down and talking with your friends and your family, right? We're always looking to go out and, and talk to new people and meet new people and strangers and, you know, mentors in your head. And, you know, you've seen all the shiny stuff around you, but it's so much gold right in your own relationships, right in your own friendships, right in your own household. And so scheduling some time to sit down and talk with your friends, sit down and talk with your mom, sit down and talk with your brother, um, is so much insight in those relationships that are the closest to you. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you have just witnessed and watched <laughs> another episode of Purpose Driven Pivot. Um, and if you didn't enjoy this conversation with Dr. Nicole Garner Scott, um, you know, watch it two, three, four, five times, you know, and I know that you'll find some nuggets in it. But for those folks that certainly uh, enjoyed this conversation, reach out to her, share her content, um, and link up with her, you know, no matter where you are on your financial journey or just in growth. If you are inspired, um, the folks that I have on this platform have. You know, Nicole, they, for people that have reached out to others, um, that's been a beautiful part of this community as well, as you join the alumni group of people that I've interviewed, really. Um, you know, folks will reach out to you, hopefully, around some of the things that you reference in this conversation, and I know you'll be responsive to them in that regard. So uh, thank you all so much again for joining us. Um, again, you can find this content at gregclay.com slash purpose driven pivot and all of my other previous interviews. And we will see you uh, next week with our last episode of the year as we kick off uh, 2021 in a very big way. Yes. Uh, Nicole, I'll let you kind of know what we what we got cooking up, but uh, we're, we're not slowing down in, in the context of exactly what you mentioned, mm -hmm. doubling down on the people that we know, we love, we support. Um, and I'm so grateful for our internal network and the people that we know that have been watching these uh, and even for those folks that we may not know or have personal relationships with, uh, just reach out to us. It's never too early to start building. Again, I'm Greg Clay. It's awesome to be with you. Nicole, you about to say something? 
No, I'm saying that's good. That's good, Greg. Awesome. All right. We'll see y'all soon. And thank you.